I came for the other speakers as well. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed the things they've had to say as much of, as, as I have. And the ability to learn. You know, I come from what I believe is the uh, finest leadership development program that exists in the world. And that's the leadership development program of the United States Army. It never stops. Four-star generals are still go to required leadership development classes. It starts as a private. How many soldiers I got in here? There's got to be a few. It starts as a private, right? And it never stops. Right? And one of the interesting things is they prepare you before they let you become the next level of leader. I was in law enforcement on a Friday. Right? I was a patrolman. Actually, I was a detective. And on Monday, I had stripes on my sleeve. And 21 months later, they sent me to my first supervisor's course. Now, does that make sense to a lot of people? It doesn't make sense. The good thing was I'd already been to NCO uh, courses for the Army. I had already, I started out as an enlisted soldier. I spent nine years enlisted. Then I had the requisite surgery and became an officer. And uh, if you don't believe me, ask any NCO what kind of surgery you go through before and when you go through OCS. Moving forward, there were a whole variety of schools that talk leadership. I've had the privilege in both of my careers to work for some of the finest leaders you could ever work for. Incredible people. People who accomplish great things. By the way, that's the sign of a leader. They actually accomplish something. And then I've worked for others in both of my careers where the only reason anybody ever followed them was out of a morbid sense of curiosity. What's this guy going to do next? I don't know, but let's go watch. It ought to be good. Right? And so what was the difference? The difference was that the leaders who were exceptional, first, they were devoted to a set of values all right, that were absolutely rock solid. Second, they had a plan. Now, you've heard today all about change. People have talked about the whys of change. I'm going to give you the how of change. I'm going to give you a process. I am a firm believer in process. We tend in law enforcement to lead and manage by crisis management principles. When the next problem rises up, we try to knock it down. The next problem rises, we try to knock it down. We do very little in terms of long-term planning. Now, this planning process isn't just for your organization. It's for you. I know something about each and every one of you because of your career field and because you're human. There are things, and I suffer from the same issues to a degree in a variety of areas, there are things you don't like about you. And you'd like to change. But how to change is challenging. How to truly take the step and make the changes you need to is challenging. And it requires a process. Right? It requires a process, it requires a commitment, it requires a dedication. You know, the second greatest gift that God gave to us after the gift of his son was the power of agency. We can choose. We have been given the power to choose. If we want to change something and we're committed to it, we could do it right now. Are we committed to doing that? Within our organizations, as current executive level leaders in law enforcement or future executive leaders in law enforcement, you need a process to follow. But let's not limit this discussion to just the organization. Let's allow it to apply to ourselves as we go forward. One of the first things we're going to do, we're going to start on the right-hand side. These same principles and processes were used to plan D-Day, were used to plan the invasion of Iraq, were used to do everything from small unit tactics to great big efforts. That's what this is about, is having a plan. It's now part of the processes that, that exist in my police department. All people, leaders at various levels, it doesn't matter whether it's a squad sergeant or it's the deputy chief, if they want to make a change and they come to me, they want to make a change, they better come bringing the plan. Don't come to me and talk to me about change until you bring the plan. And then we'll go forward from there. We'll talk about what's going to happen. On the right-hand side is the end state. We are going to clearly delineate the end state. We're going to clearly define the end state. One time I was talking to a chief about his organization, and he said, what? He said I want to change the culture. I said, great. Tell me what changes. Well, I, I, I don't like the culture. I said, well, I know that. But what does change actually mean? Let's clearly articulate and define what does that mean. 
tell me exactly what the behaviors are, tell me exactly what the environment is, delineate it for me. Put it on paper. If you can't articulate it, and you can't put it on paper, how are you going to do it? We must clearly define what it is we're trying to accomplish. That's what that means. Clear, concise, descriptive. Tell me what success looks like. Describe it to me. I can't go where you want to go unless I see the same picture you see. I can't take my piece of the organization where you want me to take it unless I can see what you envision for the future. I cannot understand what you want unless you give me intent. Instruction without intent causes confusion. I must understand why you want to do this. It's part of the planning process. And then from there, tell me how we're going to measure it. We do too much without the data. If we can't determine how to measure that success, we're going to have a hard time seeing it. If we can't discover the delta, the change, then to now, and we can't articulate it, how will we know that we're getting where we need to be? Now, I put that end state in place, I do that deep work, I articulate that all, then I can create the mission statement. How many of you have a mission statement for your organization? Good. I want you to flip over a piece of paper, I want you to write your mission statement word for word. How many of you could do that? Good. We've got at least one. That's not enough. But that's the norm. Actually, the norm is none. In the Army, all right, in the absence of orders, I default to what? The mission statement. The mission statement tells me what it is we're trying to do. If you go to a con op or an op order, and you look, there's a specific paragraph called Commander's Intent that is a description of why I want to get this accomplished. And if you have the Commander's Intent, if you know my intent, and you have the mission statement, you could get somewhere. But if you don't, now the mission statement inside my organization is required. When you fill out request for transfer, when there's an opening for transfer in my agency, all right, you must supply a handwritten copy of the mission statement. First question on a promotion examination is what's our mission statement? Okay. And it's not a multiple guess answer. You gotta write it out. That's how important it is to the organization. Okay. When I have the mission statement, I can then build the vision. I can build the vision and I need to build the vision because I have to be able to articulate it. I must be able to articulate it to you. You must see the same picture I see. You must see the same future I see. You must understand where I want to go. And then I have to do the second part of that. I have to sell it to you. I have to convince you to come along with me. Now, there's another challenge in leadership because not everyone wants to go where you want to go. Coming back as chief in January, I've been there 10 months. Uh, it's been a challenge. Because the culture in the five years I was gone, not long after I left, the chief of police then, who was the finest chief we ever had, left. And then there was a space of five years where there was a complete change in leadership style, in leadership period, and it wasn't where the city wanted to be. It ended up there. But it got internalized. In five years, you can get a culture. In five years, you can build a culture. And it wasn't a good culture. So there were some people who were quite happy with the culture, who were not happy when I came back. One of the things, we talk about all the time, we talk about mission and people. Mission first, troops always. Some of you may have heard that before. Mission first. We have to accomplish what we're charged with accomplishing, but we have to take care of our people while doing it. One of those things that we have to do in order to do that is we have to have the willingness to say no. As the executive leader, we have to say no occasionally. And that is a real lacking in a lot of executive leaders because it's going to cause turmoil. Because change in and of itself causes turmoil and then to restrict or constrain is how some people will see it, causes even more turmoil and it's hard to deal with. Good leaders are champions of change, but that means 
that there is going to be turmoil. And you've got to be out in front of it. And you've got to be prepared for it. And you've got to be willing to say, no, we're not doing that. It's really that simple. So now we know where we're going. We're going to go back to the left. We're going to go right back to where are we today. We're going to develop a clear understanding of where am I, is this organization today. And we're going to do a deep dive. It took us seven months. It took a little longer than I wanted. But we're going to account for every dollar and every minute. We're going to know exactly what our organization and each member of our organization are, are doing. We're going to know where we spend our time. And we're going to identify, are we spending our time on priority tasks and effort, or are we doing things just because this is what we do? I call it the apes in the cage mentality. You build a big cage. You put a set of stairs up to a landing. Okay? At the top of the landing, you put some bananas. You throw three apes in the cage. First time an ape heads for the bananas, you take an ice-cold, high-pressure fire hose, you knock him off the stairs. <laughs> right? Then you spray the other two apes. <laughs> I don't mean anything by that, but <laughs> right? <laughs> and pretty soon, it's called, classical, it's called classical addition, by the way. Pretty soon, what do they do? Risk for a sword, you stop going for the bananas. Now, you reach out and in and you take out an original ape. You put in a new ape. He heads for bananas. He gets crap kicked out of him by two apes who've been sprayed by an ice-cold, high-pressure fire hose. Now you reach in, you pull out another ape, put in a new ape, he heads for bananas, he gets crap kicked out of him by one ape who's been sprayed by an ice-cold high-pressure fire hose, and another ape who has no idea why he's doing what he's doing, but it's his turn to get some. Now you take out the last original ape, put in a new ape, he gets the crap kicked out of him by two apes who have no idea why they're doing this, but you know what, that's the way we do it here. Do you know how much of that is bound in our organizations? Do you know the why inside your organization and what you do? Well, you're going to find out because you're going to determine exactly where you are today. What's my current situation personally? What's my current situation organizationally? Now, when I know where I want to go and I know where I am, I can build a bridge between the two. I can develop the plan to take me from here to there personally, organizationally, spiritually, Whatever it is, I can accomplish change. But I've got to have a plan. Now, that plan isn't just jumping from here to there. That plan is developing sequential steps. What specifically needs to happen to lead us from here to there? What are the key specific events that are absolutely required to make this possible? We call those benchmarks. What benchmarks must be accomplished in order for me to get there, in what order? Again, whether it's personal, whether it's spiritual, whether it's organizationally, what do we need to do? Therein begins our change. That first big benchmark, the direction to and the accomplishment of that first benchmark begins our change. And it sets up success for the future. Once we've determined all of those benchmarks in between, we've developed, we've written out, we then take and we develop an action plan for each one. How do we do this? We appoint the people that will be responsible. We build the time based, that it's based on, and we figure out exactly how we're going to do it. In the military, in the big scheme, you have a concept of operations. That's the big plan. And then underneath that, you have specific operations orders to units who are key to the success of this path. It's pretty simple. All right. The implementation isn't so simple. The planning is relatively simple when we stick to the plan. Once we have the action plan, we can then develop a timeline. Realistically, how long is it going to take? All right. Experts say that it takes seven years to change a culture. I don't have seven years. I told the city when they asked me to come back, I said, I'll come back, but I'm only going to come for three years. I'm coming in January 17. I'm leaving January 20. I will fix the problems you've asked me to fix, and I will build a pool of leaders who will follow me that you will have confidence in. But I'm only coming in three years. I don't have seven years to change a culture. I've got three. I will not get it done, but we'll be close enough to it that the people who follow me should be able to accomplish it because we'll be operating off of a plan. And that's key and critical to our success. Once we develop the timeline, we put the key dates in place that we want to achieve our events, we then begin the process of holding our people accountable for assuring our success. Holding people accountable 
requires measuring performance. We have great folks like Guardian Tracking when you start talking about measuring performance. It's key and critical. If you do not understand, if people do not understand what's important, remember this, what you inspect gets accomplished. What you don't inspect has no priority. What you inspect gets accomplished. What you don't inspect has no priority. Are you inspecting the right things that message your plan, your directives, your intent? Or are you inspecting things that are meaningless, but again, it's what we've always done? Performance measurement based on building the criteria for success is critical for you to determine if you're on the right track and to get you there. It's critical to it. Performance measurement right, is not something that is strictly, that is strictly metrics. Performance measurement has some subjective and some objective criteria to it as well. There are no perfect performance measurement tools, never have been. When I was working on an MBA, that was my thesis was based on, was looking at performance evaluation tools. And I still have yet to find a perfect one. But you need to have one that is aligned with your priorities and you build it. You build what's important to get you to success. And the last thing is, and we're going to look up at the top in the, uh, on this uh, slide. And we're going to talk about unity of effort, unifying everybody in the right direction. That requires that all units understand their place in your efforts, what role they play. I'm a big fan of Coach Lou Holtz. Uh, we were listening about Coach Lou Holtz earlier today. I'm a huge fan of Coach Lou Holtz. Some people around here may not be, but, uh, but I am. I've read just about everything he's uh, put out. And... Uh, and uh, and uh, had, to, had the uh, opportunity to attend a couple of his seminars in person. Right. One of the things that he says, he says it's critical that people understand their role and stay in their lane. And it's true. He says, and I believe this, nobody is more important than any one person. The receptionist at the front office is just as important as the quarterback on the team. They play a role that is critical to our continued success, but people must stay in their lane. Players play, coaches coach, administrators administer, and there can be no overlap. But he also says, when we're trying to row that boat to shore, we need everybody on an oar. We don't need somebody standing up and back putting on a life jacket in case they have to bail out. Everybody has to be committed, everybody has to be driven. So we have to align everybody and get them pointing in the right direction, and that's why each unit each unit aligns its goals and expectations and presents them to the command team in keeping with our mission so we ensure everybody's on the same sheet of music. Now the last piece is about, that I want to talk to you today is about taking care of your people. We've heard some tremendous stories today about those things that can go on and those things that happen with people. It's hard sometimes to be a leader. It's hard sometimes to say no, but that's in keeping with taking care of our people. When you start listening to the stories that have happened here, I would hope it has exposed you to maybe a little bit different way of thinking. Maybe we, we, need, we need to rethink within your organization, within mine, how we do vehicle pursuits. Maybe, and when we do vehicle pursuits, maybe we need to think about building resiliency before we have an outcome versus after. Maybe we need to think about what keeps our people healthy. I'm going to use two words right now that's going to tune about two-thirds of you out. Right now, I'm going to, I'm going to cause you. It's physical fitness. I just tuned half this, if not two-thirds of you out. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're taking care of people, you are going to commit to physical fitness. There are no greater tools. To, the, the, you cannot refute the information. All right? You can have a discussion with me. You can have an argument if you want, but you'll lose. The science is clear. All right. When it comes to stress, there are no greater defense against stress, no greater defense against the conditions and the things that happen in this job, no greater way of building resiliency than to start with a platform of physical fitness. There's a mandatory physical fitness in my department. It's been there since 1996. If you fail, you lose your job. And a whole bunch of people just went, uh, it's not possible. Yeah, it is possible. It's being done in other places around the country. All right. But the key isn't just physical fitness. The key is how you message. 
and this is the last piece for you, is how you message you care. If I'm the leader, right, I don't have to be the best shot on the department, but I have to be on the range shooting, and they better see me. I don't have to be the most fit guy in the department, but if fitness is important to me, and it is, then they better see me there taking the test right alongside of them. I better be experiencing along with them everything that I want out of them in terms of change. I had better be demonstrating rather than speaking what I want to accomplish. That's critical to your success. If you message one thing and demonstrate another, you'll never accomplish the things that you are trying to accomplish. My fervor, my passion, my commitment, my dedication must lead my people where I go. I can't push them where I want to go. May God bless you in all that you do. May he watch over you and care for you in this career field, which is so challenging at times. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.